This is the Relationship Capital Podcast, where we talk to the top thought leaders and practitioners from around the world about how to grow your most valuable resource, your network. I'm your host, Adrian Chenault, and Relationship Capital is brought to you by your friends at Contact Mapping, the number one app for building your network. Hello, everybody. It's Adrian Chenault back with you on the Relationship Capital Podcast. It's great to be here today. And I am so excited about the guest that we have for you today. He is somebody who is a legend in network marketing, somebody who has done it as a field rep who has owned a network marketing company and who today is contributing at a level at the the biggest level he ever has but somebody who I really, really admire, the author of The Four-Year Career, among so many other great books. Welcome to the show, Richard Bliss Brook. Thank you, Adrian. It's an honor to be here. It's awesome to have you, man. Richard is uh, is a a great friend of of my dad, Tom Chenault, but better than that, they are, uh, I think, probably my favorite sparring partners in terms <laughs> of just ribbing each other like crazy. And uh, I have gotten to be on the sidelines of quite a few pretty funny conversations over the years. So you guys are, are pre- cut from the same cloth, I think, don't you? Somebody has to hold him accountable. <laughs> he, he needs it and uh, I need all the help I can get. <laughs> I appreciate you in that capacity. Uh, so Richard, before we dive in a little bit, you know, talk, talk about the four-year career and, and what you're doing, you know, how that sort of feeds into what you're doing today. Because I think, I think our audience would love to hear a little bit about that. Uh, well, okay, I'll be a brief. Uh, I have two books, actually, The Four-Year Career and Mach 2. The Four-Year Career I wrote, oh, about 15 years ago, but I created the concept 40 years ago. And I created it because what I found in talking to people about the opportunity of network marketing is I didn't lose people that often on my product and I didn't lose them on my company. I lost them when they considered in their mind what they would be doing as a network marketer. They, and based on what they thought they would be doing, they didn't want to do it and they didn't understand it. So if I would ask somebody, well, okay, you want to explain to me what you think you're going to be doing? They would get it all wrong, right? They, they would probably start off with, well, I guess I have to go door to door selling a product. And it got worse from there. So I just got this insight that, you know, what seems like what everybody's doing in network marketing and had been doing up to that point, 30 or 40 years in the profession was selling people on their product and their company. And then wondering why most people didn't join them. And where I found great traction, it was a quantum leap in my business is sure I sold people on my products and my company, but that was about 30% of my presentation. 70% of my presentation was teaching people what network marketing really was and how it worked and how it actually fit really organically in how they did a lot of things in their life already. And then a big feature of the four year career is it, educates people that this is not an income opportunity alone. There's a million ways to make an extra thousand or $2,000 a month, but there's only one way that you and I know that you can invest a few hundred dollars, work on a very part-time basis, develop an income of a thousand to $2,000 a month and get paid that money for the rest of your life. In fact, your kids could get that money and your grandkids could get that money. There's no other income model like that on the planet. And that's what the four-year career teaches people is how to create that in four or five years and then get paid for 40. It kind of flips, you know, the 40-year career model where people would work for 40 years and then retire for four and then die or run out of money. Yep. Um, So this is work for four years, which is just a hypothetical. Some people do it in 22 months and, some people have been working on it for 10 years and still haven't done it, right? So that's the four-year career. And awesome. Mach 2 is a book I wrote in 1995, uh, which is a culmination of everything I learned, hiring coaches to coach me and personal transformation of my belief systems. And, and the essence of Mach 2 is teaching people how to master self-motivation, intrinsic 
internal motivation. So you're not relying on the outside world or you're not relying on your results, your outcome to motivate you, but you're creating a fire within that motivates you regardless of what kind of results you're producing. And what I found in coaching people, not only in network marketing, but in all areas of life, is motivation was number one. And motivation is simply a conversation that you and I have with ourselves that we believe that either turns on green lights or it turns on yellow lights or it turns on red lights. And can, people can be motivated to undermine their success. Yep. They can also be motivated to be apathetic, which is kind of, that's the yellow light, you know, pumping the brakes. Every time you get started, you actually stop. Or you can master the art of motivation so that everything is a green light. So no matter what you want to do, you have a story that empowers you to do it. And so I work now, Adrian, in two areas. I work with a lot of network marketers on the four-year career, the authentic networker, which is a philosophy that your dad and you and I are aligned in. We just call it different things. And then I do a lot of transformation uh, work with leaders and entrepreneurs based on Mach 2. That's fantastic. And so, so many good things to dive into. I'm going to, I'm going to shift a little bit and, and ask one of the big questions first. And I think we're going to come back around and, and tie some of these things together. Cause there was like three or four things. I was like, Oh man, like we got to come back and, and kind of tie all this stuff together. But before we go there, I want to ask you a, a, a different question first, which is, this is sort of the central thrust of what the relationship capital podcast is about, which is how does somebody who wants to create that kind of asset income, that kind of act, you know, that, that sort of really true business for themselves. And they know that relationships are an important component of that. What is the, the number one piece of advice that you would give somebody about how to go about capturing the value and leveraging the value of relationships? Well, it might be academic in the context of the question. So I'll give you a couple. The, the first thing that I think about is attitude. And maybe the context of your question assumes the attitude's already there. But if it's not, it's attitude. And the, probably the simplest way I can describe the attitude is most people that are entrepreneurs, salespeople, recruiters, network marketers, they see the public prospects, if you will, as things or people they need to get. And how you can audit your own attitude is to actually pay attention to your internal language, your secret internal language that you say to yourself. And, and so pay attention when you see a prospect on a list or your phone or you meet somebody, do you notice the internal dialogue that you have sound something like, oh, they would be awesome in my business. I need to get them. How can I get them? Um, I'd really love it if they join my business, right? So just pay attention to that little subtle, quiet dialogue because that's a clue to your attitude. And if your attitude about people is that they are tools to benefit you, tools for you to get, like go get them and add them to your business, then that's a narcissistic approach to building. And it actually can work, you know? There are narcissists, they're flaming narcissists that they make money, they build teams, I don't know how they die. I don't know what, I don't know what peace they have in their heart the last 10 or 20 years of their life, but you can, you know, you can influence people. You can manipulate people. You can sell people. You can close people and you can get people into business that way, but it's, it doesn't create the family. It doesn't create the relationships. It doesn't create the heart, the spirit, the fun, the peace, the sleep well at night. It also does not create longevity. Like, I don't know anybody in this profession who has, um, you know, been a marauder from the bottom to the top 
and and their resume isn't built to the top of five different comp plans. Yeah. <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean like what happened to the other four, right? Yeah. Yeah. And how long is number five going to last? So it's, it's an attitude. And so the attitude that you want is in, expressed in this little internal dialogue, which is if you were a prospect, Adrian, how I see you when you show up on my radar is who are you? Who is Adrian? What's Adrian's story? And I mean the whole story. So the number one characteristic of the attitude of a servant leader, of a contact mapper, of a relationship builder, I say is curiosity. Now that's just a word. There's lots of other words you could put on it, but that's the attitude that I go for in coaching people is coach people to be curious about other people. If I'm curious about you, Adrian, I do two things. One, the form of my conversation is not pitching. It's not manipulating. It's not educating. It's not telling you stuff. That, that and curiosity don't go hand in hand. There's only one form of communication that goes with curiosity, and it's, that's me asking you questions. And they're not manipulative questions like, <laughs> do you keep your income options open? Gag me with a spoon, right? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. People say that to me. I just want to hit them. <laughs> no, I, I, I keep them all closed. Wow, you're really curious about me. You really care about me, right? I mean, it's so obvious the malip, manipulative agenda of those kinds of questions, right? Um, you know, you can ask people if they love their job, and that can actually come from curiosity, or it can come from, you know, somebody says, uh, I'm a janitor. Oh, you must really love your job, right? Right. Is that a curiosity question or is that a, oh, I can't wait for them to tell me how bad they hate it so I can get them. Yep. So if you're curious, you ask what I call intuitive, genuine, authentic, curious questions. What are they? I don't know. Whatever's there in the moment. And then when you answer, Adrian, if I'm curious, I listen at what I call a therapeutic level. Now, the way most people listen is, if I ask you a question, Adrian, and you're answering the question, how I'm listening is I'm actually listening to me more than I'm listening to you. And what the conversation I'm having with me is, what's the next question I'm gonna ask Adrian after he tells me what he does for a living? How can I, how can I ask him a question that would have him wanna look at my business? Uh, um, how's my shirt looking? I mean, I wonder if he noticed I hadn't had my hair cut today. I wonder if my breast's bad, right? So I ask you a question, and instead of listening to you, I'm listening to all my neurotic rhetoric. Yep. That's not listening. That's actually talking. Yep. Talking to yourself. <laughs> so I do an exercise when I teach people about therapeutic listening where people are, actually have an out loud conversation with each other the same conversation they're having with themselves. So they get how ridiculous it is and how disruptive and how rude and dishonoring it is. It's not listening at all. So I teach people a, a, a form of listening, which is like, like meditation. So if, if you're answering the question, Adrian, I'm meditating on you. Meaning, you know, kind of the art of meditation is to think about nothing, right? To remove all thoughts and <laughs> that's why they give us a mantra because it doesn't mean anything so that we repeat the mantra. It doesn't create a word picture. So it doesn't spin us off into thoughts. So if you're answering the question, Adrian, what I'm doing is meditating on your answer, which is just soaking the answer up all of it. What you say, the words that come out of your mouth, I just soak it up. I don't do anything with it. I don't, have an opinion about it. I don't judge it. Um, I mean, this is an hour long seminar, but, um, and, um, I also listen to what you're not saying. Yeah. I listen to who you're being while you're saying it. I just soak you up. And if I soak people up, all of them, the next question will come automatically, yeah. very authentically and intuitively. 
And so it's, it's first of all, the attitude, <coughs> excuse me. And it's second, <coughs> Lindsay will edit the coughs out. You're all good. Um, it, it's second of all, um, practicing the art of getting to know people and have there have the, there be a purity of that process where what I'm really looking to do is get to know you. And I kind of have a story about why that is so effective. I'll, you want to hear it or you want to I would love to hear it. Let me let me interject one yep. thing because I was just I was thinking about this as you were sharing it and uh, it, incidentally, it's funny that your wife, Kimmy, uh, had posted something about this person recently, but somebody who I think embodies this in a way that I've never spoken to this person. I've never even been in his presence before, but I think it's maybe if, if you know who Seth Godin is, this is a picture of, of someone who I think deeply listens and deeply engages. And you just, you know, you listen to a podcast with him and you can just you can tell that he really is listening and thinking about the question that you just asked him and listening to the conversation as opposed to just, you know, the politician waiting to revert to talking points or whatever that is. And I want you to think as you listen to this about somebody who you've encountered, somebody probably that you admire greatly that has that effect on you, that you, you speak to them. And even though there are, you probably consider them more important than you, they probably have more money than you. They have every reason in the world to not give you the time of day, and yet they did, and how powerful that was for you. And I would just put it to you that that alone can shift people's perception of you dramatically because people are so unaccustomed to somebody listening and soaking them in the way that Richard just talked about, that when you start to do that, it changes people it changes what they share with you it, you know just they'll open up automatically so I, i'd love to hear your story about that but i just I, I think that's a really powerful point yeah seth is one of those people anybody that you're in a room with like a room full of people and you're talking to that person and they make you feel like you're the only person in the room that's another one of those people um but the the what got me onto this uh was an article i read gosh, maybe 30 years ago. Um, and it was in Psychology Today. And it was an article that, about a um, kind of a, a project that the staff at Psychology Today put together about listening and what I call therapeutic listening, because <clears throat> as you were saying, Adrian, it's actually healing. When you listen to people at this level, you heal them. You create such enormous safety for them. They'll tell you stuff in 10 minutes. They haven't told a family member or their best friend in their whole life. Why? Because family members and best friends don't necessarily create that kind of safety. They don't know how to listen at this level. And so what Psychology Today do, did is they put the editor of the magazine on a plane in New York, flew, flying nonstop to LAX. And the project was to whoever he sat next to was to ask, they didn't use the word curiosity, that's my word, but to ask the seatmate questions about who the seatmate was and listen, of course, and then ask more questions. And the, the project was just get to know the seatmate as well as you can on the entire flight. If the seatmate asks you any questions, answer them but don't take that opportunity to turn the conversation into a long tail about now it's about me. So answer the question and then ask the seatmate another question about them. And of course, this isn't an interrogation. It's not an interview. You know, it's, it, it's, it's organic. It's natural. It's easy. You, maybe you talk about other things. Maybe you read a book for a while, right? It's like that. Yep. So they get off the plane at LAX, and uh, this is when staff members could be right at the gate, right? So the two of them get off the plane, and they, and they let the editor walk past them, because they were incognito, the staff, and they intercepted the seatmate. And they said, hey, 
what did you think about the guy you flew out here with? And the seatmate said, it's the most interesting man I'd ever met. And so they said, oh, what was he coming to LA for? I don't know. <laughs> what does he do for a living? Now, this is what they said. I'm not suggesting they didn't, you know, exaggerate, but it's what the article said, which had such a profound impact on me. And uh, he didn't know what he did for a living. Anything, you know anything about his family? Nope. You know his name? Nope. Now, I'm not saying that they didn't introduce themselves, but like all of us, how long do we remember somebody's name when they introduced, it? like not, not even, right? We can't even repeat their name two seconds later. Yep. So he didn't know anything about the editor of Psychology Today, yet the impact that he had on him in five hours was he was the most interesting person that the seatmate had ever met. And here's how that, here's how that hit me. Adrian, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, for the last 10 years, I've actually tried to be the most interesting person my prospects have ever met, mm -hmm. right? And how have I tried to be the most interesting person and why? So I can recruit them. Yep. But how have I done that? Well, wearing $3,000 suits, not in 2020, in 1980. <laughs> Right, that'd be like a twenty thousand dollars suit today, right? <laughs> <laughs> By you know, driving fancy cars and Rolex watch, right? <laughs> you know, like it's crazy. If, if you actually look at pictures, selfie kind of pictures of those of us, the 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 dinosaurs of the seventies and eighties in network marketing, you can't see a picture of us like a profile picture of us where it it's not like this, right? <laughs> Here's the profile picture. And what we make sure gets in the profile picture is our Rolex watch. <laughs> right? Oh. And, and then, you know, it's our public speaking and our cars and our suits and our handkerchiefs and our ties and our manicures and, right? And, and then, of course, if it's our time to speak, it's like, bah, 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 hey, whoa, I'm, I'm this amazing and I'm... You know, I score myself a 10 in life because I'm the most, of, right? I mean, that's how we tried to be the most interesting people. And does it work? You know, it actually does work, but it works on the bottom 50% of the class. Yep. That's Think about a, that's that. a powerful statement right there. I mean, half of us graduated at the bottom half of the class. And those are the people it works on. And is that who you want on your team? Boy, who I wanted on, I, and I got tired of recruiting people that I had to drag everywhere, including across the finish line. Yep. Um, I wanted people like me. I wanted people that were on fire, that were leaders, that knew people, that had credibility, that were smart, that were creative. And I found the way to attract those people onto my team was to actually make the conversation all about them. And, you know, I could be in a Hawaiian shirt with no watch driving a golf cart. Yep. And it doesn't matter because in the end, people look at that stuff and they're like intrigued. But from a spiritual level, all they care about is them. Yeah. And they well, want, just they want you, you to know them. They have it, right? So you, you get that element too that, you know, being the most interesting person in the world actually works the least well in network marketing because you're trying to convince people that they can do it too. And that doesn't, they can't replicate that. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it shifted everything. I, I, I it, it was actually a combination of that and an audio tape uh, by Larry Wilson on the new way of selling and the new, and his audio tape was all about commercial selling. Uh, but, his strategy in this audio tape was before you go in to sell copiers or computers or hardware or trucks or whatever you're going to sell to a commercial account, because the paradigm at that time was if you got an appointment with the buyer, you went in pitching. Yep. And Larry Wilson's tape, a new way of selling, this was 35 years ago. Um, 
the first appointment he suggested was nothing but gathering data. So I sell copiers, but what I'd like to do on this first appointment is just ask you some questions. How many copiers do you have? How many pages do you use? What kind of ink do you use? What's the biggest problem you have? What's the big expenses, the biggest expense you have? What's the, what's the most profound solution somebody could come up with for you? In other words, an hour worth of data, current data uh, analysis, yeah. and then he would take the data home, come back and present a custom presentation. Here's how we can help you. And I, I listened to that audio tape and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm using the first appointment, which is the first opportunity to talk to somebody, yep. to throw up all over them about how great my product is, when what I ought to be doing is finding out who are they? Yeah. yeah. What's important to them? What are their problems? What are their hopes? What are their dreams? What are their passions? What are they on fire about? where might there be a fit? And then maybe I come back. You know, your dad does this so brilliantly, you know, he listens, 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 asks all the questions. And then he comes back in two or three weeks and says, you know, I've been thinking about what yep. you said. And were you serious about solving that problem? Absolutely. And so there's a lot of different ways to do it, but the, the essence of all of it is we have, if we want to be successful, you know, somebody as simplistic as Zig Ziglar has said it probably the best for 50 years. If you, if you help enough other people get what you want, what they want, you get what you want. And so you just have to make it about other people. And, and you know, that's easy to say, Adrian, but we're so, needy ourselves. Yep. We're so insecure ourselves. We're so desperate. We're so afraid of failing yep. that we tend to default to old habits and sort of survival mode, which is all about us. So that's kind of where, you know, it, it, there's, there's some, if you step back and look at the big picture, how do you master the art of relationship building, contact mapping, being curious about people, making it about other people, actually the fastest track to it is your own personal development. Yep. Because to the degree that you have confidence, you have peace, you know who you are. You're not neurotic. You're not desperate. You're not second guessing yourself. You're not needy. You don't need attention. You don't need to tell your stories. You don't need to be right. You don't need any of that stuff. To the degree you have evolved to that level of, of peace and power, you actually can make all kinds of room for other people. Completely agree. So let me ask you one other question. because I, I, One of the things you touched on early on in this is that kind of that therapeutic quality of, of really listening to somebody. And one of the things, you know, I, I think there's, we, I spend a lot of time talking to people about these, these sorts of issues and, and how to do this well. And I think you, you run across one category of people that I think are, are actually, they really care. They, they, they actually are naturally listeners, but I think sometimes kind of get stuck in how do I, how do I still move a conversation forward when it makes sense versus kind of just be eternally stuck in this pattern of listening and you know oh this person is a you know is a, a shoulder to cry on or a listening ear and, and almost get walked over and so you know thought what, what would you say to somebody to help them to break out of that pattern if they find themselves getting stuck there well the questions i would ask them which is it, it may seem contradictory but actually it's a marriage yeah. And the people that you're describing are missing the other half of the marriage. So the questions yeah. I would ask them are, what are your goals? Yeah. What, what are you up to? What are you here for? And there are a lot of people, for example, in network marketing that they don't have goals. They don't have a vision. They don't have a project. They don't have a single daily action. 
they give it all lip service, yep. but they're really hiding. And what they're hiding in is the community. Yes. They're hiding in, um, oh, I just love people and I love my team and, and, you know, I love to be with people and I love to help people. And they may be seen as listeners. Uh, and, you know, there's some people that, that maybe that's their, their true nature that, you know, they're just here to listen to people and to listen to people and help people. And they don't care about building a business. They don't care about building an income. If that's the truth, then what I would tell those people is, hey, just tell the truth about that, right? I'm not here to build a business. I don't care about making money. I just love being around positive people that are going somewhere. And I like to listen to people and I like to help people. I'm not sure how you help people if you're not building, but maybe, you know, if you're just a listener, you probably do help some people that need to be listened to. So those people, uh, I wouldn't do anything with. I would just let them be, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the people that I would look for are the people that are declaring that I'm here to build. I'm going to rank advance. I'm going to build an income. I'm going to build a team. I'm going to help people economically. But all I do is sort of hang out with people yep. and socialize, if you will. So what's missing for those people is where's your goals? Where's your project? What's your single daily action? And if you had those things in place, if you had goals, financial goals, business goals, and you had a project, a well-defined project, and you had a single daily action, what, what I would coach you to do is, okay, let's use your natural gift of listening and let's marry it with, you also have a project. You have a goal, you have a vision, you have a single daily action. If your single daily action is to invite, I'm just making it up as an example, invite yeah. two people a day to look at your whole opportunity when and where are you doing that? Now, that person might say, well, you know, if you make me talk to two people a day about the opportunity, then you're sabotaging my authentic listening. No, not at all. Uh, what's going on for you is if you need to invite two people a day, you can't listen to two people a day. Yep. You have to listen to 10 people a day. Because if you're a true listener, you're not closing people. You're not listening. You're not listening to the agenda of, okay, when can I, when can I recruit them now? Can I, oh, I got to get my single daily action. I, I got to get you today, Adrian, because I haven't done my invite yet. That's not listening. Yep. But if I'm listening, if I'm in relationship, if I'm curious, if I'm in communication with 10 people a day, Every day, it might take two or three or four weeks. It might take two months for those conversations to stack up. But so, you know, uh, what happens is people ask me, well, when do I invite people in the conversation? And my answer is simply this, when they invite you to. Yep. So Adrian, if I'm curious about you and I'm listening to you and I'm asking you questions, there's going to come a point in time if you're a candidate, if you're a candidate based on what you want, <clears throat> where you're going to tell me, I really want to do this. Well, what's stopping you? I don't have the money. Do you have any way to get the money? No. I might know a way you can get the money. Exactly. Right. So I just invited you half an invite you want to look is the rest of the invite um and when did i invite you when you asked me to yeah right and so I if i if i'm curious about you and we're having a conversation and you don't ever invite me i don't invite you yeah and you know you may invite me in the first five minutes <laughs> kimmy and i marvel sometimes we talk to people for hours they don't ever ask us one question they don't ever ask us, well, what do you guys do? Well, wh what's your story? They just keep answering all the questions. They don't ever. Now, they're, they're unusual people, but there are people that they're just so into themselves. They'll answer questions about themselves for hours, and they'll never ask you about you. 
we don't recruit those people. Yeah. Why? We they make lousy money. networkers. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So if you marry, hey, you got goals, Adrian. Well, let's get serious about your goals. If you marry the goals, the business plan, the single daily action with listening, and then you do enough listening so that you fill your pipeline with people that you're serving and listening to, then you will get enough people every day that invite you to invite them. And if you're not, then you're not in enough conversations with enough people. You don't, you don't have your pipeline full. And you know, your dad is such a great example. How, how many people, I mean, it would be awesome. This would be a great project, hard to do. But what if you could diagram just like you have behind you? Yeah. Every conversation that your dad is in, let's say in the last 90 days, who are the people he's talking to? Who are the people he stays in touch with? Who are the people that he calls and says, I'm just calling to tell you I love you? Who, who are the people that he messages? Yep. Where do they live? What do they do for a living? What company are they in? Map it. Yep. And what you'll see is Tom Chenault probably has 200 simultaneous conversations going on just in a 90 day period. Yep. And I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one conversations. Yep. And so I, you know, I don't know if your dad's like personally recruiting every month anymore, but how you get to be a Tom Chenault and a seven figure earner yeah. is be in 200 conversations and trust the fact that a couple of them every day are going to, they're going to share enough about what's going on that they're going to invite you to invite them. And if you're not doing both, then you're just a social member. Absolutely. Which is okay. I, yeah. As long as you tell the truth about it. Yes. And to your point, you know, talking about somebody like my dad, he's, you know, at this point, he's, he's not recruiting because he has to recruit anymore. He's recruiting because he's genuinely curious about people. And inside of that conversation all the time, time problems, money problems, and health problems are cropping up and he has a oh, solution to that. And yeah. so that's, that's who you become. And I think, so two things you said that I think I want to hammer home and then we'll wrap up here is one, you, you talked about that, you know, you want them to ask you to invite them but what that really meant is that you're, you want them to get to the point where they're sharing where the pain is in their life. And then you're able to be curious about what that looks like instead of pouncing and then to offer organically a solution. So that happens really naturally. There was no, you know, nobody's feeling like, oh man, you were just trying to corner me until you could pitch me. Like that was the most natural question in the world for you to ask. And then a generous offer for you to make to be able to say, hey, I might be able to help you with this. And yeah, that's I, what we're trying I, to do. I think it's important to acknowledge, hey, we are in the recruiting business. Yeah. We're in the sales business, right? I mean, this is we're we're not monks yeah. wandering <laughs> the world, curious about people such that we empower them. That's not what we're doing. We're in business. And so the truth is that from the business standpoint of things, we are recruiting people, we are selling people, that's what we do, okay? The, the question is, how do you do it? And when I say, when do you invite people or when do you sell people? When they sell you on selling them. Yeah. When do you recruit people? When they recruit you to, re to recruit them. When do you invite people? When they invite you to invite them. And when they are inviting is when just like, it's just a different way of saying what we've said for decades. You know, when people share their pain or their passion, hey, if you have a solution, now it is an organic, natural thing to do. And let's acknowledge that's what we're doing. That's our business. The difference is the Neanderthals in our profession, hi, Adrian. What do you do for a living? Ha, ha, ha. J-O-B, just over broke. What are you doing for <laughs> retirement? When's the last time you had a first class three week vacation? What kind of car do you drive? <laughs> do you keep your income options open? Well, I, you know, I, if I could show you 
how to make an extra $5,000 a month, uh, you'd be interested, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's, it's so a true. Different way at, it's a new way of selling, as Larry Wilson said 35 years ago. And, you know, it's, it's the sugar high versus the, you know, a diet that's going to have you live a long time. You know, when it cut, bringing this full circle to some of what you shared at the beginning, you know, you, you can't, you know, you can throw 2000 people at the wall a day and, you know, 20 of them might stick and, you know, whatever, if that's what yeah. you want to do, fine. But if you, that, that is not going to last right past you and it's going to be a hard way to do it even if maybe it gets you the first dopamine hit faster yeah. than doing it the right way there's Don't. a very powerful analogy to flying your dad and i are private pilots and there is a flying cliche that's really powerful there are old pilots and there are bold pilots but there are no old, bold pilots. <laughs> and network marketing is the same way. If you look at, uh, I forget how long your dad's been a networker, but probably 30 plus years. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm entering my 44th year full time. Wow. And so if you look around, folks, look around. And look at how long people have been doing this and the people who have been doing it for a long time. And I don't mean hopping companies over and over and over again. And, you know, sometimes people change companies. I get it. But the role models you're looking for, if you want to do this for the next 40 years is go find somebody who's been doing it for 40 years that has credibility, that has integrity that has a good reputation and is living the kind of life you want to live. And so in network marketing, the word might not be bold. It might be reckless. Yeah. So, you know, there are old network marketers that have been doing this a long time and there are reckless network marketers, but there's not any old reckless network marketers. Why? Because they completely burn out their soul. They, they burn their soul right to the ground. They, they trash their integrity, their reputation, their network. I mean, right behind you is the, the contact mapping. I mean, you know, they go to their contact mapping app and they got nothing but flashing red alerts, right? <laughs> you know, burned, this contact burned, this contact burned, right? Because they just used people and they lied to people and they hyped people and they have nothing left. And where do those people end up? I don't know, but they don't end up with 100,000 people on their team in a legacy network marketing company earning residual income for generations of their family. They don't. But there are lots of people who are. They've just gone about doing it as a servant leader. They've made it about other people. And that's how you do this for decades and decades and decades. And, and the longer you do it, the more peace you have and the more power you have, more personal power you have, the more gratitude you have. Absolutely. That, that's the course. That's it. That's the work. Richard, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. You, this is somebody who really is a gift to not just the network marketing profession. It's bigger than that because I think you really speak to timeless principles that apply no matter what form of entrepreneurship you're in. And Richard, I just can't thank you enough for spending the time with us before we wrap up. Where, where's the best place for people to find you if they want to learn more about what you do and, and tap into what you're up to? Uh, where I teach the philosophies uh, that we've talked about is in the Facebook group, The Authentic Networker, uh, which is a free Facebook group, The Authentic Networker. And then the body of my work lives on richardbrook.com. 
awesome with an E at the end, richardbrook.com. And you're absolutely right. The, that authentic networker Facebook group, you really want to go check out what he's doing in there. It's fantastic. So Richard, thank you again. I really appreciate you and look forward to doing this again sometime in the future. Awesome, Adrian. Thank you. And congratulations on contact mapping. What a great, fantastic tool for people to keep track of all those conversations. <laughs> I love it. Awesome, brother. Thank you so much. Have a great one. Yep.